Oh, right. yes. Been, Spam it. It's been promoted on the Trump group. Okay. So, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 16 of the MB Red podcast. Um, we wanted to get an episode in. Sure, I mean, what, we're just two weeks from our last episode, but a lot's happened in the political world. And today, former Vice President Joe Biden made his big VP pick, uh, Senator Kamala Harris from California. So we wanted to talk about Joe Biden's big VP pick um, a few days away from their convention, which is actually next, starting on next Monday. And Kamala will speak next Wednesday. Joe Biden will speak on Thursday. So he's kind of pushing it a little closer to the, I guess, uh, self-imposed deadline. But he ultimately decided on Kamala Harris, although it's kind of rumored that way for a few weeks. Politico had something about it, I think, two or three weeks ago, Dane. So I'm not sure what the holdup was. Um, but yeah, that, that's the pick. So we're going to talk about uh, Biden's pick of Kamala Harris, and we'll kind of see how we'll discuss our thoughts if we think it'll have much of an impact one way or the other on the race. Then we're going to talk about the race between Trump and, and Biden, which has definitely tightened a little bit since our last episode. It was a nine point margin nationally, it got down to as low as six points uh, the other day in the real clear politics average. So we're starting to see some tightening in the race. So we're going to talk about that and how Trump's poll numbers as of August 11th compared to how he's how he uh, compared against uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016. And then we're going to conclude our episode talking about this, what I think is a somewhat fascinating race, again, in the Ohio 13th Congressional District. Tim Ryan, who ran for president, um, as Trump said, he was a zero because he got zero votes. Um, running for re-election against Christina Hagan, who was once again endorsed again by President Trump last week in Cleveland. So we're going to talk about that as well. So let's wow. talk Kamala Harris, wow. unless you have anything you want to, 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 to start off with, Dane. Uh, this angle is really bad. Uh, normally I'm in my, my study, and right now I'm in the bedroom, and uh, this angle is, is really, really bad. But whatever, what are you going to do, you know? Uh, I guess I'm going to have to live with it. Can you hear me all right, Michael? Yep. Is, yeah, you sound I'm good. Like, like, wow, well, well, that's hopefully good. My internet's good tonight. We'll see. Now I have a question. Or so I'm wearing like a little uh, a button-down shirt, right? Collared shirt. Um, Oxford collars, the people like to call it. Uh, are you, as an accountant, is that what you wear to work? The YSU T-shirt. No. Uh, is there a dress code? What is? What do? Oh, there's nothing dress code. To work? I, I did work in the office today, so I had a. I think I what did I have an Under Armour polo shirt on. Typically, okay. I would have like a dress down shirt on. Um, okay, you know, a nice pair of pants. But uh, uh, do you have to wear a tie? No, no, um, no, no tie. No although tie. one of our partners who I know listens would probably prefer that we wore ties, but we do not wear ties. So uh, pretty, you know, business uh, business appropriate. I think is the term they like to use there at work. So it, it's not yeah. overly structured, but you know, dress down shirts, especially in the winter when it's colder, but uh, this time of the year, polo shirts for sure. Or no, are you officially licensed CPA? Yes. There's actually wow. fascinating real quick blurb. There's actually three Metzingers in the state that are CPAs. Yeah. Uh, me, my cousin, Phil, who works with me at Hilbarth and King. And then another Metzinger, who I think is a distant relative that works at a competing accounting firm in Youngstown. So there's actually three of us in Ohio, and we're all in Mahoney County. Okay. So, wow. That's really Not that's that really there's many Metzingers in Ohio, though. Well, it's Metzinger's German, right? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. That's very cool. Yeah, as a, as a uh, banker, I have to deal with accounting all, all the time. Um, but I just pretend great like I know what's going thing, on. Don't we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, wow. Well, that's exciting. Well, listen, I, I know we're going to get into some really spicy stuff, but I just really was curious as the dress code of an accountant. Yeah, um, no, I just, uh, once I get home, this is my dress yeah. code at home. Wow. Wow. Well, I hope the, the team wide as well. So anyways, yeah. So what's going on? I heard there's some political news today. What's, yeah. what's the latest? Big, the uh, big story, Biden finally picking Kamala Harris. So I thought before we kind of go into the political aspect, let's talk a little bit about her personally. So she's 55 oh, yeah. years old, 55. born and raised in, in California. She's from Oakland. Uh, the interesting thing I think we'll learn a little bit more about her in the days ahead is her 
history because um, she's a black woman, black uh, U.S. senator from California. She's actually the daughter of a Jamaican um, immigrant and the daughter of an Indian immigrant. So very unique uh, background from, from that perspective. So I think we'll hear more about that. I believe from the article I had read before the episode started, she actually, her parents got divorced when she was, I think, seven. Her mother passed away probably, I think it was uh, probably about 10 years ago, something along those lines. So um, like I said, we'll hear more about her in her history, I think, in, in the weeks ahead. But she was a district attorney in San Francisco from January of 2004 through January 2011, and then became the state attorney general in California in January of 2011. And what I did not realize until I just saw this was she actually won that race by less than a point. It was like a 46-45 yeah. margin against a Republican, ironically enough, in, in, in a state like uh, California. But I think there was a couple – Quite a few third party candidates, a libertarian, a conservative party candidate as well, that probably if they weren't in the race, she may not have won that race because the margin, again, was less than a, a one percentage point. And then after Barbara Boxer retired in 2016, she became or she ran successfully against a fellow Democrat because they do things differently in California, obviously. Um, and so she's been the number two senator in California from January 2017 to present. And obviously she ran for president last year and she was my she pick. Win? She did not, but she was my early pick uh -huh. to be the the uh, the candidate. And I went back here, because uh, we talked about this on our initial podcast, uh, one of our first few episodes. She actually was the front runner in the betting markets from June 30th of 19 through August 1st. Remember, and we'll talk about it in a minute, but she had a really strong first debate Yeah, uh, against, she actually went after Joe Biden, I believe that was the debate. And so she surged and became the front runner at that point. And then she kind of fizzled out. She had a poor debate against, and especially a, an aspect of a de debate against Tulsi Gabbard. And it kind of went down. Tulsi Gabbard. Through. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. So um, that's that's kind of some background as to Kamala Harris. So I think you're forgetting one of the most crucial elements of the background of Kamala Harris. And I'm not saying this facetiously because this is going to come up, right, is her affair with uh, married mayor of San Francisco, Willie Brown, when she was, I believe, 28, 29, um, and he was 60, 61. Um, so this is a piece of Kamala Harris backstory that I think is really interesting for such a feminist icon like Kamala Harris, you know, in the past, um, you know, conservative feminist icons like, uh, Margaret Thatcher, for example, she had to work hard. She had to, you know, study, um, got a degree from Cambridge in chemistry, worked very, very hard, ran as a conservative MP in the fifties, climbed the ranks, eventually became the minority leader and then the majority leader when she won in 79. But Kamala, see Kamala is, a, is a, a modern feminist, which is a little bit different. See, Kamala Harris had an affair with Willie Brown, who at the time, I, I think it's Willie Brown, right? Who was the mayor of San Francisco. And he appointed her to a position that made $75,000 a year in the early 90s, which was which was big money back then, it's equivalent to like $125,000 a year job now. Um, and he appointed her to all these really highly connected political positions because she was his girlfriend. He um, he was still married, but he, he took her on dates and stuff like that. And she was able to leapfrog, you know, the normal career that would take hard work and uh, time and effort by dating Willie Brown. And then, of course, she broke up with him after she became politically established and uh, married a very wealthy financier of a husband. I think he's in finance of some sort and became a social justice warrior, right? Um, she's one of these types that, you know, she's completely married into the financial elite of California and, uh, yet she's going to hasten the revolution, right? Like it's, oh, okay. Uh, but that's, we're, are we talking about the same Kamala Harris? Is, is that the same Kamala Harris? Are we allowed to say that, that she used, um, this relationship to get ahead in politics? Now, obviously she's, she's clearly an intelligent and accomplished person of her own, right? But she did short circuit the process. And I just think it's interesting for a left wing feminist um, 
that she used a man in a relationship with a man to get there. I don't know. I don't know. Is that is anybody else aware of that, or is it just me? Well, uh, yeah, I, I I was not, but I know you mentioned it. I think in the last debate, or not last debate, last episode about the extramarital affair. And yeah. I, I'd be honest, I'd have to do more research, but I do see here there are articles about it, and I'm sure it is going to be brought to light in like the weeks ahead. Especially, it seemed like each side kind of had their talking points ready to go, depending on who was being picked. So I think that'll be like one in the second or third wave of. of of information that hits social media here in the next few days about her. Uh, is Kam Kamala Harris is also the cop, right? That threw people into jail because their children were truant or um, in, in like, it, there's a bunch of stuff where she was like the local prosecutor, um, the County prosecutor. I'm, I'm not sure what it was, but she was, you know, the meme on the internet is that Kamala is a cop. I guess maybe after the Democrats are, done defunding the police, they're then we're going to have Kamala run what's left of the, you know, withered away emaciated police departments. I don't know. And, and throw um, marijuana smokers in jail. I don't know what the strategy is. Um, do, uh, I have a question. So when do you think Biden learned that his VP pick had been chosen for him? Like, do you think he learned today? Do you think he still knows? Do you think, um, do you think he didn't pick Susan Rice because he got kept getting her confused with Condoleezza Rice? So they're like, yeah, just pick Harris. I, I, um, I know. When do you think he was informed of it? Well, what was fascinating was there's a picture floating around on social media. I, I can't um, fact check it, but it was Biden in front of a laptop with Kamala Harris and he had his phone, but he had notes behind his, his phone, which were essentially like a script for his phone call. To like right. say, hey, we're picking you to be our V. I'm picking you to be our VP candidate, and it was kind of like, you really? Why do you need that? I mean, we we for us on the right who have been talking about Joe Biden and his cognitive decline, not a huge surprise to us, but it's kind of fascinating. But I, I think the thing that I'm still confused about is again, it was two or three weeks ago where Politico leaked a story that it seemed as though Kamala Harris was going to be picked two or three weeks ago and had like these talking points and yada, yada, yada. And then it, she, she wasn't picked. Then it made it seem like first week of August, they were going to make a pick. And then they announced that it was going to be delayed. I just want to, I'd like to know what happened behind the scenes that triggered the delay. And then ultimately picking the person that seemed to be the front runner in recent weeks. You know, a couple of people brought this up, but like the way that was handled was really weird. Um, I think what was weird was that, uh, and it's a good question. Like I don't, I don't have an answer for it, uh, not to not to ignore it. But I think what was weird was that Biden kind of boxed himself into a corner because he basically said that it had to be a woman and it had to be a minority, right? And I think that he looked at the slate of candidates. I don't think that he and Kamala personally get along well. Like if I had to take a guess, and this is apropos of nothing, right? I don't think that they really mesh well. I mean, didn't it wasn't it Kamala that said that Joe Biden was like a racist segregationist? Right? Like yeah. does anyone else something along that? those lines? And I I have the transcript of that and, and, and I'll share that. Oh, okay. I don't wanna I don't wanna yeah. But like here's the thing, right? If I were to say like, you know, Michael, you're a horrible, horrible, horrible human being and you know, you personally discriminated me as I rode on the bus as a little kid. Right. And then it's like, oh, by the way, can I be your vice president? You know, it's like, uh, how does how does that work out? Explain that to me. Phil, figure, figure that one out. I don't know. I guess she just didn't mean it. I guess she just totally made that up and, you know, was just being very insincere, which isn't surprising because she's a politician. Right. That's not you to call Harris. But, mm -hmm. you know, huh. Yeah, so, so let me briefly share the exchange. I, I'm only going to share kind of what Kamala Harris had said in the first debate. Joe Biden responded, but this you can kind of get the gist of the point of the debate, the first debate, the first of how many debates. And there's, you know, there was two of them. The first debate, there was two nights. And this was really the first moment where things really got heated. So let's see here. So she's talking about kind of growing up. And then she says, I'm now going to direct this as Vice President Biden. I do not believe you are racist. I agree with you when you commit yourself to the importance of finding common ground. I also believe 
this is where it kind of confusing when you actually listen to the whole clip. It's personal. It was actually hurtful to hear you talk about the reputations of two U.S. senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. It was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. There's a little girl in California who is part of that second grade class to integrate her public schools. She was bused to school every day. That little girl was me. I will tell you that on the subject, it cannot be an intellectual debate among Democrats. We have to take it seriously. We have to act swiftly. As Attorney General of California, I was proud to place, put, a, put in place a requirement that all my special agents would wear body cameras. Um, and then Biden responded. But that's really when things kind of got heated, where Biden wasn't even talked about. She had a, an opportunity, and she just went right after Biden. Because at the time, Biden was the front runner at that stage. And it actually was a very effective moment for her because. Um, she, many pundits thought she won the debate. Obviously, the betting markets agreed because she became the favorite for a little over a month's time. But that was kind of the, the heated exchange. And I think there was a few other ones as well. But just out of the blue, Kamala going after Biden. So what do you – yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting that she was attacking Biden for being a racist, but now she's going to be his VP candidate. I don't know. Like, what, What's your take on, on Kamala Harris? I, I, you know, to me – I'm going to give you my honest opinion, right? In 2012, Kamala Harris, I don't know if she was senator at the time or she was the attorney general. Of attorney California. general, yes. Right. And she was a name that started to populate because people were thinking about who comes after Obama. And one of the names was there's this rising star named Kamala Harris. And she's very talented. She's very quick on her feet. Um, she's a minority woman. you know. So she was checking all the boxes. So I was thinking in 2012, like Kamala's going to be a superstar. She's going to come on the scene and she's just going to dominate. Like there's nobody that can, can be beaten. 2016, she didn't run, surprisingly. Uh, they let Hillary, the queen, take over, right? Um, and then she – so she announces her candidacy and she, she starts her campaign. And what I was surprised by was kind of how mediocre she was as a politician, right? If you look at the great politicians of the past 20 or 30 years, um, I think you have to include people like Bill Clinton, uh, Barack Obama, uh, George Bush, George W. Bush, anybody that got elected president right, has to be a, a good politician. But also somebody like um, – I'm trying to think of some other people like uh, Howard Dean, right, really charismatic guy. Woo, um, woo yeah, right, Howard Dean. Um, Sarah Palin, you know, like her or not like her, she was a big influential influential force for a while, right? Scott Walker was kind of this influential force, and then he kind of became a dud. Um, but like, uh, I, I'm trying to think of some other names, but like Kamala Harris on the stump wasn't super impressive. Like she wasn't bad, but I don't think she was dynamic. I think she was a very much a three out of five candidate. Um, on her best day, she was maybe like a three and a half, and on her worst day, a two and a half. And she was just kind of unimpressive. And I remember watching the debates being like, you know, this is the one that's going to surprise us. This is the one that's going to dominate it, right? And she was just really, really weak. She was weak. She didn't do well. And it wasn't that she was bad. It's just she kind of faded into the background. So I had a really high opinion of Kamala Harris, and she just has kind of failed to perform. And um, I don't know. We'll see as the VP candidate how well she does. But don't forget, like, she ran in the primaries and she lost, right? She wasn't able to attract more than – I don't know what five percent support nationally. I mean, at one point she was the front runner, right? But that was way before any voting. So I look at a candidate like Kamala Harris, and I think it's like it's the safest pick, and it's kind of bland. It's kind of a bland pick. I don't think she brings a lot of voters to the tent. I don't think she really drives up turnout, but I don't think she really hurts voters. You know, I don't think she hurts his chances in any ways. I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm wrong. I think she just is like a net neutral. That's how. That's my interpretation. This could all change, right? But I don't know. What do you yeah, What do you I, think, Michael? I, I'd agree with the whole the net neutral statement. I, I don't think she she wows a ton of people. Maybe on the left, and, and I'll mention it. I'll just mention it now. I didn't realize. I had looked at. There's a website, gov, govtrack.us. There's another one, Progressive Punch. I'm not sure what that one is. But the first two websites I looked at where they kind of grade uh, politicians in, in terms of you know, how liberal conservative they are. The GovTrack website actually ranked her the most liberal senator in the U.S. Senate right now. The other wow. website, Progressive Punch, rated her the fourth most liberal. So regardless, she's up there with Bernie Sanders, with Elizabeth Warren. She, but maybe you don't 
necessarily hear her in the same conversations as you would with 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 um, Warren and with Sanders. Uh, I'll say this: I, I was impressed with her not in the debates, but in the Kavanaugh hearing in twenty what was that twenty eighteen? In twenty eighteen, uh, yeah, I was too actually. Yeah, yeah, going? and I think and, I and again, I I was listening at work the whole time, so I, I couldn't see necessarily all the optics, but I could listen to the line of questioning, and you could hear the different. Um, senators questioning Kavanaugh, it, and her and actually Amy Klobuchar were the two I kind of was were most impressed with with their line of questioning. Klobuchar more from the perspective of she was actually somewhat reasonable with Kavanaugh. Uh, Harris, you could tell that she was an attorney and she was a prosecutor, and I, I thought she it was a good uh, moment for her to kind of introduce herself nationally because remember the number of eyes on that whole Kavanaugh hearing were, were huge. Um, in all those hearings, the, the numbers were really were really huge. And there's actually a, a great book. I well, I listened to it because I don't I'm not a big reader. I listened to a great audio book by Molly Hemingway on it. Highly recommend. I know I'm I'm a poor uh, political what a, observer, but I, I I need to do a better job with that. But I did listen to it recently. Well, by Molly Hemingway. Molly Hemingway. I recommend it. Anyhow, so before one of our first episodes of this podcast, we were kind of giving our initial thoughts and, and I had said, and maybe even Dane, you, you kind of were up there with me that probably in the top two or three, we thought Kamala Harris could be, I had her as my number one. I was wrong, uh, but I, I, I thought highly of her after the Kavanaugh debate and then the Kavanaugh hearing. And then after the first debate, again, she had that really strong moment against Biden going after him. I'm like, wow, this is, you know, it's looking like it's going to be Kamala. And then, when Tulsi hit her in the second or third debate, she really fell off. And then after that, she just was ho-hum in the debate. She never did horrible, but she didn't seem like she had much, much fight in her anymore. And she just kind of faded faded away. Um, the the people, I, I think you're absolutely right um, with your, your assessment. She kind of did fade away, right? Like there was a lot of uh, sound and fury behind her, and then it just signified nothing in the end. Um, the people that I, I think following Facebook that are most excited about Kamala Harris are like the the Hillary Clinton groupies. Um, I think that there's like echoes of Hillary Clinton in Kamala Harris, um, and they seem to be very very excited about her. But I think they were already going to vote Biden. Like they weren't going to vote Donald Trump. Not in a million years. <clears throat> the Bernie Sanders people, I think, are mostly going to vote for Biden, but they don't seem to be like super excited because of Kamala. Like, if they were on the fence, I don't think this swung them either way. Um, so I, I don't know. I just, I think at the end of the day, this is going to be kind of a. It's not the, it's not the worst pick. I think some bad VP picks, in my opinion, were Tim Kaine, horrible VP pick. He added nothing to her ticket. Um, Paul Ryan was a disaster, right? Who did he win over? Like middle-class accountants <laughs> in the suburbs of Youngstown, right? Uh, Sarah Palin, I think, was net negative in the end. She was very positive in the beginning, but then dragged on McCain. She, she was the positive end. with the base initially, but she yes. was very weak with independents and Democrats. I think she was – she brought the ticket down. To uh, eventually, extent. eventually, yes, yeah. Eventually. It, it took some yeah. time, but eventually – it got to that point where the media kind of framed her in a light where she was just had no business being on a national spotlight from being yeah. the governor of Alaska, the mayor of what Wasilla, Alaska. Wasilla, yeah. So now yeah. being trusted with that. Remember that the phrase, the 3 a.m. phone call, or right? Was that the, was that the 2016 election? I, I no, that was 2008. They all blurred. A Hillary primary ad against Obama, I think, the 3 a.m. phone call came about. But anyways, so the point is, you know, I, I don't think this is a, a bad PP pick. I just don't think it's a, a great one. But who else could have bind it? Who else could have Biden have picked, right? Susan Rice. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. She's just kind of bland. I, I mean, she was the NSA advisor, right, for Obama. There were some foreign policy uh, disasters on her watch. Um, Libya, namely, I think that was under her. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. She was the NSA advisor when Libya went down, so I don't think she brings a. Susan Rice was it was an, uh, another kind of safe but also boring pick. Uh, Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams did not win the race to be the governor of Georgia. I know she thinks she did, but she didn't. Um, she was a, a horrible candidate, uh, or she would have been a horrible. She would have been the Sarah Palin of like the left, right? She would have excited the left wing base, but I think she would have lost independents and moderates. 
Um, I think Amy Klobuchar would have been relatively strong, and I think she was probably in the lead, but then they burned down Minnesota. And uh, I don't think the Democrats want to be talking about Minnesota anytime soon because they, they kind of burned down Minneapolis. And we'll um, talk about that in, in uh, our next segment on Minnesota. Poll came okay. up today. Oh, okay. Yeah. Emerson, yeah. it's not a Republican pollster. It was a two-point race. Yeah. In a state and, that even Reagan could not win. And yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, let's get we'll to that in a sec. That. No, so the point is, the point is, at the end of the day, I don't think Kamala Harris – I don't think she adds a lot to the ticket, but I also don't think she takes away. I see that there are very few people that are going to be won over to Biden as a result of this, but I also don't think he lost many. Okay. I, I could be mistaken, but um, I don't think she'll be the top issue of this race, um, which is ironic, right? Given Biden's advanced age, you would think that his VP pick would be really crucial, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't think it moves the needle that much. Yeah. I, I mean, I think ultimately, especially if, if, if after the first debate, I'm not sure how the, the presidential debate is, the schedule compared to the VP, but if, if, if Biden does struggle in that first debate, let's say it's before the VP one, I think it's going to really uh, cast a light on how important the VP pick is for him. And especially if the race tightens, you're going to have some people who are going to realize, like, okay, well, you know, it's our belief that, you know, can Biden actually serve a full four year term? Eh, not not so sure. And the way CNN wrote an article today, they don't think so either. So yeah. I, I think at some point this VP pick's going to come in. It's going to be critical one way or the other for some a segment of voters, which could sway some close states one way or the other. But I, I'll say this, and I know we talked about this one of our first episodes. She doesn't necessarily drive the the minority vote her way. I, I don't think. Um, I don't think so either. Not, she's not overly i don't think she's super popular obviously it was south carolina the african-american vote for, for for biden there that really gave him the opportunity to become the the, the eventual democrat nominee but I, I don't know if this is necessarily going to drive minorities out in big numbers i think the media is going to try to frame it that way i don't know if it's necessarily going to happen i don't think it does i actually i i don't think it i i think that the 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 effect on black turnout is surprisingly um, mute. I think it's going to be muted at the end of the day um, because I do think that she black women like her, but I do think that black men may be turned off by her. So I don't, I don't know. I, that's my initial take is that it's, it's a neutral effect, um, but I'm willing to reevaluate that. And by the way, I just want, I want my internet points in December 31st of 2019. I called both Biden and Harris as both the candidate and the vice presidential pick. You can testify to that, Michael. I did and see that. Water, by the way, I want people to know this is this is just a water. It's a Whole Foods water. Yours this is, is Bud Light. <laughs> what happened to a Dane drinking wine on the episodes? Uh, you know, it's that's a Tuesday. Thing. I tr I don't I don't drink wine during the week. I only drink it during the weekends. That's fair. I heard. I usually, honestly, this is the last beer that we had in the fridge. I'm not uh, a big drinker, but. I figured for our episode, why not? I've been keeping it up. Uh, John Metzinger in the chat, who ironically enough is another Metzinger in town, who is a uh, real quick story, fu funny story. We actually had a psychology class together, a big auditorium, had no idea. I think we were like sitting next to each other and we saw the attendance sheet and we both realized we were Metzingers. I, I think that's how the story went. And um, turns out he's from McDonald and um, he uh, is like minded to. to uh, me and, and other Metzingers politically. And so he chimed in. There wow. was ne never any other pick, but I'm not sure what elector electoral base they're going for in regards to Kamal. Electri yeah. Elect I think that's uh, a good comment. Yeah. I, I, I think John's absolutely right. Uh, there never really was any other pick, right? They created this fake drama over it, but it was going to be Kamala or nobody. Um. And uh, yeah, so they, they told Biden it's going to be Kamala, and then he promptly forgot it. They told him again, and then he forgot it again. And then they wrote it down on a cue card for him, and he, he remembered it long enough uh, to make it five minutes, and he probably forgot it again. But and speaking of you know forgiting things, what about these uh, polls, Michael? Should we move on to the polls? Kamala Harris yeah, is just let, boring. Let's... She's just, wait, wait, I just want to say one thing. Elizabeth, I miss Elizabeth Warren. I miss. I was thinking about this the other night. I think I'm the only human being that misses Elizabeth Warren, and Elizabeth Warren was spunky, 
right? She was smart. She turned off a lot, a lot of people because she was just such a wasp, right? Uh, you know, she just was the quintessential lady that would not let your grandfather in the country club because he was Italian or Irish and Catholic, right? That's that's Elizabeth Warren, right? And now she's a progressive, but most wasps in, in are. And um, I miss her. She was exciting. She had this energy, right? She's like, oh, yeah. Oh, I can't wait to tell you about my plan. I got a plan for that. And yeah, I was dorky, and, and but I missed that. And there was something so joyful about that, like a, like a dumb puppy. And not she's very smart. Like I'm not saying she's dumb, but I, I miss that. Kamala Harris is just like Kamala Harris is the the woman that like she was raised in a wealthy household because her father was a economist, and she's the woman that like will unironically try to get a McDonald's worker fire because he's like a white guy and he didn't use the white right pronouns, right? She's the woman that will like fly into Youngstown and be like, everybody here in the city of Youngstown, you need to all check your white privilege, right? And like, you know, a third of this the town who are white, they have like heroin needles coming out of their arms because they got laid off and their factory got outsourced. And she's not going to do anything about that, but she's going to tell them you have white privilege and you need to work to address it. And you need to, you know, amplify other voices in the room. That's Kamala Harris to a T. Right. Meanwhile, she came from like a very wealthy family. That's Elizabeth Warren. Or right, that's Kamala Harris. I, and that's just boring. It's just lecturing. It's annoying. I miss Elizabeth yes. Warren and her energy. Anyway, sorry. Well, I, um, you know who you really should miss? Who? The vibes of Marianne Williamson. And my cousin oh, Nico chimed in. Legend. Yes. One of my. Legend. She, when she talked about the calling up the prime minister yes. of New Zealand or whatever. I'm yes. like, what is she, what is this she, this she was talking pretty, about? But she was fun. Yes, she really yes. made watching the debate very, very interesting. hundred percent. I agree. Whoever said that comment. And Nico. your wife just chimed in in the chat that you need to break out the Marianne shirt, uh, bring it back out. Oh, I will. I will. I, uh, I don't, I'm not wearing pants right now, so I'm not going to walk away from the camera, um, it, but I totally would. And, and one last point as I get a notification on, on uh, Facebook, I want to thank Gino DeFabio, who was on Fox News uh, a few days ago, and he was the uh, Trump supporter at the uh, Trump rally in 2000, and let's see, this would have been July of 2017, shortly after my first son was born, who Trump called on stage. Anyway, he, he's, uh, he's watching us this evening. Oh, thank he you. Has a, he has a watch party going, so I want to appreciate it. Say thank wow. you to Gino thank you. for your thank support you. yeah. and, and all the good works you do for um, not only for Trump. I know you're a big promoter, but you're also really pushing hard for Christina Hagen, who we'll, we'll, we'll talk about at the end of the episode. So, well, let's let's get on to the election. Let's let's yes. what's going on the election, yes. Michael. Can so, we give the latest polls? What's yes, what you okay. I'm a big I'm a big poll guy. Uh, yeah, polls. I'm not like Nate Silver at 5:38. I don't have some big model, but I also feel like I'm somewhat practical and reasonable when it comes to polls. Well, I, you know, we we talked about it. Last episode, the last two, Trump was down nationally as much as nine points, uh, over nine points. At one point, he was down 10 points in the national average with real clear politics, which is usually kind of the consensus website where people look at where you're not citing one, one poll, you're citing multiple on average, which is the better way to go. So he was down as much as, I think, 10 and a half points. The lead cut to, according to what I saw the other day, was down at 6.2 points. So he shaved off three to four points in a matter of a month. And part of this, I will say, is, and I have it in my notes for this episode, I don't know if it's a new campaign manager or what, but he seems to be much more focused. He hasn't been getting into many Twitter wars with, with uh, Joe Scarborough about whatever. Um, he hasn't had many questionable tweets. He, he's been, to me, laser focused, which is what he needs to, being down between, let's say, six and seven points right now nationally. Uh, what's also helped is the jobs numbers have continued to improve. The, the stock market, which I follow every day on CNBC, again, nearly hit, um, the S&P nearly hit all-time highs today. The NASDAQ, prior to the last three days, was hitting an all-time high. So the stock market's doing very well. The economy has rebounded to an extent. There are still plenty of people unemployed. Um, but it's at least framing the argument more back towards the economy, away from what he was struggling with, which was the riots and, and racial I'll say injustice or what have you. Um, so he, he's, he's narrowed the gap. But what I really want to talk about is ultimately what, what happens nationally really doesn't matter because we don't vote on a popular vote model. Um, we don't elect our president that way. 
you got to look at take a deeper dive into the poll numbers on a state by state basis with the uh, battleground states. So what I did was as of August 11th, I looked at Trump's margins or deficits in most cases deficits on this date in 2016 versus 2020. And in about half of the states, uh, Ohio, PA, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Georgia, he's actually polling better as of August 11th of this year compared to four years ago. And then in, let's see, North Carolina, Florida, Arizona, or actually in just those three states, he's actually polling slightly worse. But he's, believe it or not, and you're, you're never going to hear anybody talk about this, in the battlegrounds, he's, he's right where he was at four years ago. And ultimately, remember, his numbers actually cratered after the Access Hollywood tape before rebounding and eventually winning some of these states. So I think he's in a fairly good position right now leading up to the conventions. I don't think you're going to have huge bumps one way or the other like you typically would from conventions. I think Democrats, I'll give them credit, I think they usually run some pretty good conventions, at least the poll numbers show that. I think they do a pretty good job with the optics, their speakers, and all that. Um, I don't think you're going to have those huge balances because these are virtual <laughs> Do, do you think they're going to have Bill Clinton speak? He is. Yes. Uh, and, and is Bill Clinton he, is Tuesday night, so get ready. He's going to go on for 90 oh, minutes. Oh, really? That's rich. A, that, that's that's really rich because, you know, I remember in 2016 when I said, hey, I'm voting for, for Trump. They're like, oh, he said nasty things, and he did nasty things. Well, you know, at least he uh, didn't rape two women, uh, Juanita Broderick and uh, Kathleen Wiley. And uh, at least he didn't fly on Jeffrey Epstein's plane down to uh, – you know, on the Lolita Express down to that uh, that island, right? Oh, Democrats, you're the party of women, right? And you're you putting Bill you know Clinton up. Not give, me a, covering give, me, it? give me an F. Yeah, give me a break. If Trump was on that, break. that listing or that affidavit, it'd be the top story across the board. Yeah, but of course, down in mind. Bill Clinton. Not that it matters. He's, you know, we all know that he has a checkered past. It's just he's a rapist. Further reinforces that that believe that he is very questionable in terms of his character. You know, so, the, Demo the Democrats are the same ones who are shutting down our entire economy. So people, you know, 85 can stay alive for an additional month, but then they'll turn around and vote for rapist Bill Clinton. And by the way, this stuff was known in the early nineties. Okay. It's not like this is all like stuff that came out later. They voted for Bill Clinton. And as one woman in the New York times op-ed page said, I don't care what he is. I just want to keep abortion legal. So, you know, don't don't I I can't stand when the left lectures people on morals, right? Like, get off your high horse. Anyways, sorry, I'm not gonna go down that path. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. Oh crap! Did it did it freeze? Did I get? Did we get to Michael? Did it? There we go. There we go. Did did I get cut out? I was no. I, was uh, I heard there. I heard virtually everything you you okay good said, said there. So one one last point related to these polls is. Uh, like I said, I don't think there's going to be a huge convention bounce. And I said in the last episode how I thought Trump needed to get it kind of within a four to six point margin by the time the debates happen, which I think he's ultimately going to do. And um, I, I think it's just going to come down to if the economy can continue to improve, he's going to have that working in his favor. Um, another thing, and I, this is a, a tangent, but I do want to say this, not that I necessarily <laughs> agree with the essence of the ex executive orders. I think the optics of it are good in, in the sense that he's being viewed as someone who's fighting to protect those, the American people right now who are struggling while the Republicans and Democrats duke it out. I don't necessarily agree with um, spending all this money. Who cares? Uh, I know. I, I, under, I, I know where you're coming from, but as, as somebody who – who claims to be a fiscal conservative, I'm going to practice what I preach here. Um, but I, I think the optics were good, and I think it's going to benefit him. I don't know if it's going to benefit him much in the polls or anything like that, but I think – Michael? I think you uh, cut out again, bud. What's going on with your internet? One second. No, there you're, you're back. You're there back. we go. I apologize, yeah. everybody. If my wife's watching, which I know she is, uh, I'm hoping she's not streaming anything on TV. Um, I, I'm, I'm to the point where I just need to buy a new router. Anyhow, uh, where was I going with this? 
I'm not uh, even the, the, the money, the money, the money. The, oh yeah, uh, yeah. So I just think monies. you know, with with you know, we're people who follow politics closely. There are plenty of people out there who really don't follow politics at all and don't care, but may eventually vote and who are hurting right now. And you know, at this stage in time, you know, maybe they need this money or what have you, and they at least say, hey, you know what? I don't agree with a lot of what the guy says, but at least he's fighting for me. So I think optics wise, it, it was a good good thing for him to do. I'm not even sure those are legal executive orders, to be quite honest with you. But I think who cares, right? It, 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 wasn't it, it, I think it worked. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I just think it was the correct thing to do. Yeah, DACA was illegal, and then the uh, the other one, DAPA. There was one that was declared explicitly unconstitutional, and, and and they did it. You know, it's it's not like this is the one thing about the right wing that always kind of amused me. And Republicans, they're like. Uh oh, you know, we're going to fight this battle, but let's make sure we don't use swear words and follow all the rules. And it's like, well, we're losing constantly. Well, maybe we'll, maybe we should relook at our strategy, you know? Um, and, you know, interest rates are at 0%. So uh, let's just give everybody money until the interest rates tick up again and then we can curb it. Uh, let's just give as much money as we can so that Donald Trump can win again. And then we can control the Supreme Court for a generation. Wow, Dane, you're you're a hypocrite. You know what? I I've just learned that caring about principles and stuff just doesn't matter. It's all about it's literally all in politics, not in personal life. It's very different. Your personal morality is very different. In politics, it's all about winning. Go ahead, Michael. You're going to say something. No, I I did I, I did want to share because I had I'd let Dane know we have somebody who's interested in joining us. So I do have. Who's oh. going to briefly join us for this episode is uh, my cousin Nico. Who's Nico a- Suave. Oh. Michael, you uh, you froze again. Or okay, I have the worst. Oh, whoa! America there he is right now. So Nico, Nico, uh, thank you so much for joining us. So we were just talking. I'm sure you probably heard some of it. I just just want to kind of real quick. I did hear it. I just want to say, Dane, what an absolute honor to finally get to uh, talk to you in person. To me, yeah, to me. I, I've Are been you serious? since the start of this podcast. Um, I love the sponsors that you have. I, I know you're you're sponsored by the mattress company. That was oh cool. yeah, we are. <laughs> um, the t-shirts. I know that. Uh, <laughs> I know that Tim Ryan, he had a real soft T-shirt, which was uh, that was good. That was probably the best thing he had going for him. Yeah, yeah a diehard totally. fan here, Dane. I just oh, thank you. Wow, it's just an honor to finally to finally meet you. Well, listen, I, I just want to say I don't know how much Michael paid you um, <laughs> to say all that, but I hope he pays you more because you you're gonna help me sleep well at night. Uh, thank you. My ego is already massive, and you just made it a little you know a little bit bigger. So thank you. I'm sure my wife will really appreciate that. Um, I, I really appreciate it, Nico. Do you uh, do you have a, a question or a comment? Or well, I actually you- I want to get your guys' take on this because it's a huge yeah. thing. It was talked about in 2016 a lot. And uh, I just want to know, 2020, what are your guys' thoughts on, you know, down ballot voting from each candidate? How do you think Biden helps down the ticket? And uh, how do you think Trump helps? Good question. That's a good hmm. Michael, do you have a good well, take on it? I'll take an initial take because I think it was in 2016. It was the, the Republican candidate in New Hampshire was not pro-Trump necessarily. I don't know. Was it Kelly Ayotte? And Kelly, yeah. It, actually, at one point. Throughout the night, that was one of the closest states where Trump. Oh, Michael's cutting out again. Oh no! Oh no! I can hear you. You can hear me. Michael's hey, we cutting out a little bit. Yeah, let's just take over this podcast. Sorry. Okay. Michael. Yeah, I think that's, I think we'll have to do it. Um. So that's a great question. I I think it depends on what type of voters Trump is able to turn out, and I think one of the success of 2016, one of the really compelling things about Donald Trump is he was able to bring to the Republican Party a new type of voter, you know, call it the working class, call it whatever you want to, but like people that felt really disenchanted by the political system, they turned out, they voted for Trump and they voted for Republicans, by and large, down ballot, right? And uh, that was able to help Republicans win, you know, in, in the Midwest and across the board. So if Trump can replicate that strategy and he can do that, pull that, you know, uh, rabbit out of a hat a second time, 
I think that that will that will help Republicans across the board. I don't think that the House is in play. I think the Democrats will probably keep the House. But I do think that he can if he pulls out enough of these voters that Republicans in states like Colorado. Right. Um, I'm trying to think of some other races that are really tight at the moment. It will be able to put them over the top. So that's my take. I don't. I think it's it's all about the coalition he's able to bring out. And I also don't think Biden is going to. I don't know. I, I I I don't think Biden's going to excite a lot of people to the polls. I, I don't know. Maybe it's it's all it's an anti-Trump vote. It's not a pro-Biden vote. That's the that's the thing that I think a lot of uh, with Biden is that, and with just the whole Democratic field is that I think it's it's way more split than the uh, the Republican field. I think the Republicans are more just split on Trump or no Trump, and they're still the Republican Party. I think, but the Democratic side, you have. The progressives, you have the moderates, you have the Joe Bidens. You, I mean, it, it's it's such like a diverse thing that's happening in their party, and I that's another reason. I know you guys already moved on from the vice president pick, but uh, I think he would have been better off with someone other than K- Kamala. I, I I don't know if he was if she was the best pick necessarily. But who? But who? I'm well, like, who do who I, would be your who would be the other pick? I think Elizabeth Warren would have been way better because she could have got progressives behind him. I think personally, but then at the same time, he did say he was picking a woman of color. So, I mean, I felt like if he backed down on that, that would have been way worse than anything else would have been. So I agree when you're going with what he said, I think Kamala was the best choice. Yeah, but, that's, I think you, you absolutely hit the nail on the head. Yeah. I, if, if he opened up the field, even if he picked a guy, right, he could have yeah. picked somebody different. Right. But I don't know. I don't know. Michael, are you back? Is your internet working? You look so angry right now. I, I don't um, know. I, I'm. A, it, I am going to buy a new it, router tomorrow. So, and I and I re- re- reduce my video settings from high definition to standard. So hopefully that helps. I did want to add in real quick. Uh, Sean Kerr in the chat says anti-Trump vote brought a lot of people to the polls in the midterms. Don't necessarily need to have Biden to be energetic when the Trump hate is so fierce. Uh, I mean that's that may true. be the case, but. The, it, 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 especially on the uh, the House level in 2018, that was definitely the case. Uh, uh, but the Republicans still had a, a decent name on the Senate side. In, in one state to really watch closely is throughout 2018, Florida did not look very good for the Republicans. And ultimately, they ended up winning the gubernatorial and the Senate seat in what I thought were kind of two upsets in, in that state. And it followed, it mimicked election night 2016 in that state where – Democrats got a one or two point lead, then the panhandle came in and then wiped away those leads and gave the Republicans the ultimate win. So, uh, but I, I get the idea of anti Trump vote, but I also would say don't underestimate the pro Trump vote and especially those pro Trump voters who will own, who have, who did not come, who only came out in 2016 and have not voted since, who will come out again. I think there's more to them than we think. You know, I have to say, uh, I and this is I'm back on the topic of Trump in the polls. I, if a couple episodes, I was really bearish Trump. I was like, "There's no way this guy's going to win. He has no message. He's down, etc." But over the last couple of weeks, the momentum has really shifted, and I got to say, I've seen far more Trump signs than I did a few weeks ago. And I feel like he's, his campaign has more energy. The firing of Brad Pascal was was a great decision. I think Brad did horrible, and uh, the new guy seems to be doing all, all right. And I also think what nobody is saying, but I think it's bubbling under the surface, is the coronavirus thing, right? And I think people are kind of feeling like, hey, maybe this is all bullshit, and maybe it's all going to go away November 5th. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not allowed to say that, right? But maybe the media is deliberately hyping it up. Not, I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not saying it's a hoax. I'm not saying any of that. But the media is deliberately creating hysteria and hype because they wanted to keep the economy depressed and, you know, put the Trump administration on the back burner. And I think there's a lot of people, there's a lot of resentment building up against these continued stay at home orders and then the mask wearing and all that. And I think that two months ago, majority of the public was in favor of all of it. And I think that the numbers are shifting. I don't know if, you know, if if it's tipped over and there's now a majority against all of it, but you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff on the coronavirus and, I think that there is a popular backlash and that the teachers, you know, the teachers want full pay, but they don't want to do full work. Come on, come on, you know? And I mean, the thing with the teachers that I understand that, I mean, everyone has some reservations still about going out and whatnot. There's been people that have worked the whole time 
and it, I, I just don't understand. I, I do, I, I feel for them, but I just don't see how you can make the case that teachers should not be working when everyone else right. is going to work. Right, right. If we didn't have Zoom, okay, if we didn't have all these telecommunications, the teachers would be back in there, no, no doubt. Uh, they'd have to, because either that or no education, right? And that's not feasible. So I don't know. I, I just, I, I think that the momentum is starting to shift, right? Because the case numbers, new cases have come down. The death rate has come down dramatically. And I don't want to make this whole Corona again, but but I just feel like the the, the vibe, the energy is just shifting in the room. And it's, well, and it's I, becoming I, more I, pro-Trump. I think that's what's helping Trump, because I think if you take out the coronavirus, there's no, I, I don't even think this would be an even close talked about race because I mean when you had the economy that Trump had you could just run right off of that and that's why I think the media has been pushing this coronavirus narrative for how long it has been and uh, I'm not a denier or anything like that uh, I mean I, I just you know I yeah, think that's, I'm not either yes yeah. I, I want to say that I don't want to give that impression but I, the media I mean just on the way here I was listening to a clip from CNN and I just they said <laughs> They have these people on it. I just don't understand how you could call yourself a news channel and have like some. The person on said, I think this really just shows the difference in the party that you have Joe Biden picking Kamala Harris as his running mate. While he said Trump and Pence are still being the cheerleaders for the Confederacy. Like, how do you say that on the news? I don't understand. I He said and he said um, she's going to she's going to energize the black uh, women vote and which and he said which have been the backbone of the Democratic Party for generations upon generations upon generations, which I find hard to believe because if you go back a certain number of generations, I don't think any black people were voting for the Democrats. When you yeah, get I don't think so back there. So I just don't understand how you could have these people on the news and call them experts when I mean it's it's just it's it's really bad right now. Listen, these experts on the news are largely idiots, right? Because they all <laughs> predicted that Hillary – no, 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 they're, they're idiots. They, I can tell you what they can say. And they all predicted Hillary Clinton would win, and, and they were wrong. And, and they all predicted that the, – to go back even further, right, the same class of experts said the Iraq war would be a swimming success, and it was a disaster. They said we should be going into Syria. We never should have done that. You know, they, they always have – whatever the experts on the, the media say, do, do the opposite. Uh, if they said, like, you know, look both ways before crossing the street, then just run in that street. I'm telling you, you would be safer uh, because the experts are, are wrong. They're really wrong. But here's the thing. There's no accountability. So, like, they'll get on TV on Monday. They'll make a bunch of predictions. On Tuesday, they'll be wrong, and they'll be back on there. You know, they were wrong about, in recent memory, um, the George Floyd death, now that the body cams have been released. I know we're not supposed to talk about this, but it wasn't exactly how the media described it. That's number one. They were wrong about the Russia investigation that, oh, they're going to get Trump any day now. Nothing came of that because there was nothing there. They were wrong about the Covington kids. Remember these 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 14-year-olds, right, under the age of 18. They weren't they adults. Mean, oh, how much they, do you yeah. have gotten that settlement? Like it, yeah. So they were wrong about that. And they were not only wrong, they, were, they, they lied about it. So the media is consistently wrong. I, I think that the media is going to – the lockdowns, I think, we're, regardless of how you feel about the virus, the lockdowns were not effective um, at all. And they had huge costs that outweighed any benefits. And I think there were very few benefits. And the media was all on board of that. So, anyways. Another just, thing, I don't, I, this is another thing that might come off, uh, I don't know, a little hot on here. Uh, I personally, I, personally I, I dread watching Fox News with the exception of certain people just as much as I do CNN or MSNBC. Because it's literally just the same thing, but the other side. Uh, yeah. You go, on, you go and watch Fox News. Say Trump said something I, I, or did something horrible. Okay. They're not going to talk about it. It, it. You go to CNN, it's all they'll talk about. Biden does something horrible. You hear it on Fox. You don't hear it anywhere else. You can't, you can't have news like that. It, it's, it's ruining the country. I think that's – it's honestly – when Trump says it's the enemy of the people, I don't know if I, I – it, it really – it really is. It's it's getting out of hand. They're dishonest. There needs yeah. to be something that changes with it. I I, I, I want to add real one real quick one point. I, I I listen to CNBC every day, and I think if people really want to have somewhat of an unbiased or middle of the road view of, of of news, and and politics, more from the perspective of people who follow the stock market, 
I like the people on CNBC. I will will admit they're and you know what? I listen to them and I'm trying to figure out honestly like how certain people lean politically that the different anchors and there's a whole bunch of them throughout the day. I really can't tell you how any of them leans because and they had Pelosi on, they had Mnuchin on the other day, they've had Pence on, they've had them all on. And they're pretty fair. Granted, you got to understand they're not always on there and it's a financial network, but I I will say I like getting on news from there. So, all right. I don't know how I, I've, I've watched the podcast of, of course, a bunch of times. Uh, I just don't know how it works in the sense, do you guys have a lineup of topics or can I open something up? I, I'm curious on your take on something. Am I allowed to Michael do that? Michael has a spreadsheet. He has a spreadsheet. I have a spreadsheet, um, but as, as Dane, what you have to ask Dane. Well, I, I want your, I want your opinion as well on this, Michael. I just want to know. All right. I, I don't know if you guys have talked about this. I've actually, I've been working all summer. I missed the past couple podcasts. So I, I don't know if this has been touched on, but name shame. It, it's uh, I feel like it's not talked about too much, but what, what do you think the landscape looks like post Trump, say the 2024 election? I mean, do you think the Republican party is still going to be competing in states that Trump is competing in, but the Republicans have not traditionally competed in at all? You know, I, I just want to know your take on that. What do you think's next for the uh, for this country's political landscape? The parties are. I'll take a first stab. The parties are evolving. Um, the Democratic Party is becoming a coalition of the very wealthy and the very poor. And mm-hmm. the, the 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 operating economic model for the Democrats uh, is as follows: open borders, uh, free trade, complete globalization, and then tax people usually the, the middle class to like redistribute the wealth down to the, the losers. Right. So that's basically it. That's their model. It's, it's a neoliberal model. You know, you have immigration destroying wages for the working class, but the argument is it will grow GDP faster. We'll just tax them, give them money. And the, the model for this is New York state and California, right? Where if you're a middle class in either of the states, it's really hard to get by. Um, if you're a young person trying to start a family, unless you're like in a really high paying job or you're very poor, it's, it's hard to get by. That's going to be the Democratic Party of the future. And it's going to be that coalition, right? The Republican Party is increasingly coalescing around this like vast middle class um, middle movement. And they're not quite there yet. This is I'm saying these are where the parties are evolving. And the Republicans are a party of the, what they call the, the petite bourgeoisie, right? Um, like the little shop owner, the small business owner, the middle class guy uh, in the working class. Right. And the, the ideology hasn't really fully caught up with this, but they're like the guy that just goes to work, brings home his, his food and a, a lunch pail or that is barely getting by trying to save a little bit, you know, not necessarily on welfare, but not really that rich kind of just stuck in the middle. Think of the red states, right? Like that's Indiana and that's Ohio. That's even states like Tennessee and Oklahoma and that. That's where the two parties are going. And increasingly, I think the Hispanics may start to gravitate towards the Republicans because of their working class uh, position. Um, So what does that mean for 2024? I think it just means, I don't know who's going to win in 2024. I think it depends on who wins in 2020. But I do think that the Midwest is going to continue to trend Republican. The coasts are going to get bluer and the South is going to get bluer. Texas is going to go blue. And it's not going to go blue because of Hispanics. It's going to go blue because of yuppies working in Austin. And all the tech bros who turned California into a hellscape are going to move to Texas and turn it blue. I think the same is probably true with Arizona. It's likely going to be true with Georgia. And in return, Republicans, I think, gain states like Ohio, which is now solidly red, um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and potentially Michigan and Pennsylvania. That's my okay. Yeah, and, and, and I'll piggyback off that. I think that's good, and it kind of this will be a good segue into our, our last topic about Tim Ryan versus Christina Hagan because it kind of, in many ways, we've 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 talked about the 13th congressional district and and how Ohio is shaping up politically, and how we think that ultimately this might be the district that gets removed, costing if if Hagan can defeat uh, Ryan, this will be Ryan will end up losing his seat. We think maybe in 2022. But again, it's the shifting demographics. Whoever would have thought that? Um, let's let's just go. For example, 2018, great night for the Democrats nationally. Who would have thought on a great night for the Democrats, the Republicans would would win a state representative and state Senate seat in Mahoney County? I mean, I know I never. I, I I was shocked Don Manning won. I didn't even vote for him. I didn't think he had a chance because he's ran. 
he ran so many times before he and it, not so many times he ran before never won i'm like ah, i'm not gonna waste my vote um and then michael Rooley ended up winning but on a on a good night for democrats that should never have happened in a once very reliably democrat area like the mahoning valley so we're seeing it firsthand on a local level how demographics are are, are, are changing um and how the state's kind of evolving you might see maybe definitely central ohio has become much more blue and there's i think there's some hopes with uh many liberals that I've, I've read on on social media that columbus kind of becomes like that urban utopia of like how chicago is with illinois where the rest of the day is completely red and chicago just dwarfs it in terms of votes it's not going to happen in ohio i just think there's there's too much population outside and when yeah. you've got a big populated area like let's say the suburban counties around cincinnati um parts of uh, northeast ohio there's that's the most popular populated part of the state and if you're not having big margins for the democrats there you're not going to win statewide so it'll be interesting to see but i think um that's a good segue into our, our last topic which was which is christina hagan versus tim ryan which i wanted to touch on again um last week president trump was in cleveland they were at I don't know which airport, maybe Burke Lakefront, and called right. Christina Hagen up and once again said some positive things about her and said, again, you have my full endorsement and said Tim Ryan's a zero. Um, and yesterday, last night, I was watching TV with my wife and a Tim Ryan ad came up. First TV ad I could ever recall for him in probably 15 years. I remember he had ads back when he first started, like, Mo Tim Ryan, like a catchy jingle or whatever. Um, but he, he had a negative attack ad against um christina hagan which sort of surprised me that he would be doing that and again for, for trump to double down and to see uh, ryan run an attack ad i'm beginning to think that there might be more here i just don't know if he'd be spending all of his money on attack ads if he didn't need to and one, one more point about tim ryan is he raises a lot of money on election by election cycle i don't know where the hell he spends it but like like Dan, you see these numbers that I have here. He's he raised one point yeah. six million in twenty eighteen. He spent all that money. I don't even know where he spends it because he certainly well, didn't need to spend. It. Sometimes they. Give I don't it know how that works. They sometimes for candidates will give it back to uh, like the kitty, right? The Democratic Congressional Committee or something gotcha. like that to help candidates in other areas. So it's a way of buying influence. It's like if I have five million and I don't need it, I give it to them. But you, you got to be loyal to me and return that's that's what i think he's doing but yeah but, he's, he's uh, raised a lot of money yeah so he's he's already raised eight hundred sixty eight thousand this year um i don't have the spending numbers up on here dane but he spent probably close to five hundred thousand already but the interesting thing is in 2018 chris de Pizzo ran which i thought was an admirable campaign he didn't have much support from the national uh level raised ninety four thousand dollars got 39 percent of the vote it was more much more of a grassroots campaign Christina Hagen has already raised two hundred thirty thousand dollars, roughly, and it's probably going to be even more now that Trump has endorsed her and, and pushed that. I think this was this may have been the June uh, financial numbers here, not even the July. So I think you're going to see this number jump quite a bit. So uh, again, this is a district that has been reliably blue. He's won huge margins virtually every election. It's hard for me to say I'm confident. Christina Hagen has a chance, but I also am reading the tea leaves, which makes me believe there might be something going on. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel it too. Um, she's probably been the strongest challenger he's ever faced. I mean, the fact that he's oh, without question, face, she without brings question. credibility to the ticket, which they never had with most most of these candidates, because she was a three time state rep in Ohio. Right, and and the other thing is the fact that he's running a negative ad is big, big, big deal because. Every dollar spent on an ad in the Youngstown area is a dollar that could have been going to a Democrat in a more competitive area. So I, I think that they probably saw some polls where he's ahead, but slightly. And if Trump does well, she'll do well. And it's like way too close for comfort. And, you know, it's like, you know, Michigan and, and Wisconsin. Hillary was safely ahead. And then funny enough, she didn't win. That's how I kind of feel the situation with it, with, it, with uh, Mr. Ryan is. I don't know. I think that a, Tim Ryan had a lot of good. The sad thing about Tim Ryan is he had a lot of goodwill. Um, I think he was a good guy when he started running. I think that he wanted to do well for the district and the area. 
Uh, but he just went nowhere with it, right? He just, he kind of sputtered out and he kind of sold out and he became this far left guy. And if he would have just stayed a moderate conservative Democrat, he would have A, been way more influential and B, he would have been still just as popular and he'd probably have leadership position. But if you go to the left wing, you can find a dozen people that could be a better left wing representative than Tim Ryan can. So it's kind of sad in a way. I mean, you can't feel sad for somebody that makes $179,000 a year. Um, but it is kind of sad, right? Am I wrong? I think a lot of people in Youngstown kind of feel let down. He's like the chill can factory, right? It was like something <laughs> all the type. And it's like, oh, it's going to save the area or the blimp factor. We've had a few of those like over the years. The, yeah, they, and he was one of them, and he just has gone none. But I will say this. I am, and he I ran am, for president. That was so dumb. And he got zero votes. Uh, I am becoming more optimistic about the future of Lordstown Motors. It seems like everything that could needs to go right for them has gone right. And... It, it seems like it might happen, and it doesn't look like it's contingent on this USPS deal because Workhorse is a completely separate company. So that's a complete aside. But I, I want to make one point with this, and I think it's a point Christina Hagen needs to hammer home with, with, with voters, especially in our areas. Tim, and I posted this on our Facebook uh, thread last night, has your part, has the Democrats moved further to the left or middle while you've been in, in, in office, and has our district moved from to the left or to the middle? And obviously that the parties move further left while our district has moved more to the middle. And he just completely does not represent the 13th district anymore. At one point in time, he did. He, he Like you said, Dan, he was more of a moderate Democrat. Not that, you know, we're reliably, we were a reliably Democrat area, but I never thought we were ultra liberal in an area. We had a blue, blue collar, that union type vote. We were never a San Francisco type uh, Democrat party. Uh, it, it, and I think that's what no. Hagan needs to do it, to, to, to really catch people's attention is, is to, to paint him as being out of touch because he's gone left with Nancy Pelosi. There's no doubt. I know he ran against her for Speaker of the House, um, a futile attempt, but I, I think that's what she needs to do. I mean, and, and I know she she is a fan of our Facebook page, and, and hopefully one day we could get her on. But I know Nancy she's, Pelosi. she's or Christina no, 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 Hagan. No, Christina Hagan. I was gonna say, uh, Nancy Pelosi, a fan of the show. Uh, I didn't no, Nancy, yeah, no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Look, look, look. Nancy Pelosi has like millions and millions and millions of dollars and eats like fifteen dollar a pint ice cream, Jenny's. Right? She's she's totally out of touch. Her, her refrigerator is costs you know more than a small car, and and this is the lady that's supposedly leading the party of the working class. That should raise some alarm bells with with people. Um, and she's like, she's almost 80 years old. Is she eight years old? It's yeah, like that's, I so. yeah. Come on, guys. Come on. I don't know. I, Nancy Pelosi, I think she's a very smart woman. I think she, she's a very capable leader, but like, just retire. You know, it, it's, it's such a boomer trait where they just don't step aside at all. They refuse to let go of anything. Um, and so Nancy Pelosi, but, but Tim, he's done, you know, it's one thing if you're very liberal and it, you, you get leadership positions, but he's gotten nothing from it. Um, and he's, he, he's, he's, I don't know. He, he's, he's kind of, a, he ran for president. He ran for president. Why? What? He was think, he had a better chance before running for president of being president than he did after he ran for president. <laughs> and he announced on the view. He announced on the view. Okay. There's not, a, listen, I, I'm, this is going to be very mean, but I just have to. No, you've said this there. before. I know where you're going with this and I'm looking forward to hearing it again. If you're, if you watch the view. And it's not because it's on at your dentist, right? But it's because you're like, I'm going to sit down and watch The View. And you're like, I'm going to watch this show to inform my own political opinions. You shouldn't vote. You're the <laughs> you're the reason why, you know, people make arguments against democracy. If you're, if you're watching The View and you're like, this is a really high-level discussion. I'm finding this very insightful. You should not be anywhere near a polling booth, okay? They should take your ballot registration and just burn it, okay? Because it's a... It is the greatest argument against democracy since like Mussolini came to power. Okay. And Tim Ryan decides, Hey, I'm this white working class guy. I've got grit. I'm from Youngstown. Okay. My factory that employs 5,000 people just, just went out of business. <laughs> I want to fight a campaign for president for the working man. Where am I going to announce? Right. Oh, I'm going to go on the view. I'm going to go on the view. 
So like Sharon from Topeka, Kansas can, you know, see me and be like, well, I guess 10 years ago, he was kind of sort of cute, you know, and then forget who you are. What a dumbass move. Tim Ryan is the biggest. That was the dumbest. Sorry. I got to stop. I got to stop. It just gets me so angry. Got to watch that. Got to watch where you're going with that. It was so I dumb. The discussion back to where Dane goes on his rants about the lemon grove. I think those are the best discussions. <laughs> That ties into Tim. Oh, Hagen, the Lemon Crow, Bob Hagen, Bob Hagen. No relation to Christina. Bob Hagen, yeah, Bob Hagen, who used a racial slur against a black man at the Lemon Grove. That's not nice, right? He called somebody. Buckley, his wife was uh, just accused who, of of a racist statement as well. Yeah, I don't know yeah, if you saw that. Wow, thing. that's. Yeah, I did see that. I did. I didn't understand it, but I did see that. Yeah, I didn't understand it either. It didn't make yeah, any sense. Weird. Hey, I, I love I, it, I bro. Want to one, one quick, well, actually, Nico, go out. I, I think you had a point. I'm gonna. I was just gonna say, just to, we're talking about Congress a lot. I it, it, I highly recommend it. Any political junkies out there, um, you guys got to watch on HBO the Swamp. It was a great documentary. Highly recommend it. It's just, I think you'd all enjoy it if you're watching the show. I'll have to check it out, but Nico, out, I don't know yeah. if, if Grandma and Grandpa's uh, email and the password are going to work for HBO anymore. I don't think HBO uh, Go is a thing. I might not be able to get HBO anymore. I um, I I, I could tell you that it does indeed work on. Okay, well, let my wife know so that my kids can watch Sesame Street again. <laughs> I, There's a uh, side note: HBO Max. I think Aaron would love it. Elmo actually has his own talk show, so you've got to give it a watch. <laughs> wow. Maybe, uh, Maybe Tim Ryan can announce there next time. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's totally right. That's a great point. Yeah. Him and Cookie Monster could eat some uh, cookies I, together. I would afraid, though, that Elmo is a little bit on a higher intellectual level. I, I do think it. so, too. Yeah. Yeah, so you got to be careful. Elmo's really, right. really good with those. Tim Ryan was perfect to meet with Whoopi Goldberg and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Megan McCain. Megan, Megan McCain is one of the most worst. Yeah. What what does Megan McCain bring to the table? Her father was John McCain. That's it. Like it's she like hates okay. Trump, but like CNN, yeah. and she's the token Republican uh, representative on an ultra liberal show. Yeah, and what qualifies for that? Her father was John McCain. Like that's it. That's nepotism. That's the purest display of nest. I can't stand nepotism. That's why I can't stand Jerry Kushner. Um, <laughs> Megan McCain is just yeah. Your father ran for president. He also lost. Okay. You know, I like people that run for president and win, Megan. Uh, that clearly wasn't your father. Uh, I don't know. I Megan mean, McCain's annoying. I can't stand her. I, I don't know. I can't even fathom hating my own self enough that I would want to put on the view. Like, you will never live this life again. Once you're dead, you're dead. And who can say to themselves, I spent hours of it every week watching what? the view? That's just horrible. That's horrible. The sponsor of today's episode is uh, Whoopi Goldberg. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to make one final point is, uh, you know, we were talking about Tim Ryan and how he started out as a moderate Democrat. And I'm just going to throw this out there. And if anybody in the chat wants to respond after this episode's over, how do you guys think Jim Trafficant, who would he be supporting? Because he, love him or hate him, good, take the good with the bad with the guy. He was all over the place. He pissed off people on both parties. He People love them from both parties, especially later on. He seemed to maybe take a more conservative stance. I don't, Nico. I don't even know if you know. I mean, I'm not sure you are aware of Tim or Jim Trafficant, and maybe we've seen some of his videos. But Dane, you might be more. Um, maybe you want to take a first stab at this. A couple times. Yeah, Jim Trafficant was a proto-Trump. He was a populist. He wasn't really liberal. He wasn't really conservative. He was a populist. He was a somebody that fought for the working class. Um, at least that's. That's what he claimed to do. And he, he kind of straddled the left right spectrum, right? He's somebody that would defend social security or Medicare, but also be against illegal immigration. Um, and he, he wasn't a Paul Ryan Republican and he wasn't a Kamala Harris Democrat. That's uh, that's Jim Trafficant. Um, it's, it's sad that he was, you know, probably murdered by Hillary because uh, he accidentally saw some of Bill Clinton's travel logs on the uh, White House desk in the early 90s. And Hillary's like, got to take him out, got to tie up the loose ends, tip over that tractor on trafficking. Now um, this is turning into something that's supposed to be on Facebook. A lot of, uh, a lot of conspiracy <laughs> on here now. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm being facetious. I, Hillary I, didn't, <laughs> she did not kill trafficking. Um, 
you know, she killed other people, but not trafficking. Uh, he died of his own core. Are you, are you in district 13? What district are you in? Um, I'm not actually, I'm in uh, Dave Joyce's district. I'm okay. in Geauga County. All right. Uh, if, if it helps, yeah. what's, what's interesting is Nico and I literally are two minutes apart and we're in completely separate districts. Nico, I, what, are you in Bill Johnson? I'm in Bill Johnson's district and I can't Tip wait. Uh, I just, I was telling Michael when he's done, I'm going to, I'm going to throw my hat in the race. So I just want that to be known. Maybe I could get some uh, grassroots starting to form here on the MV. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I, like I, would, it. I would gladly donate. It, uh, it might be a Mahoning Valley only congressional district at that point, though. You might not have the uh, sure. reliability of the river to help aid you. Yeah, I don't know if you want the guy who thinks Hillary killed traffic to endorse <laughs> you, but uh, I don't, people. That's a joke. It's a poor chase joke. I know, I know we're starting to wrap it up. I just want to give a little a last thing. I think this could be a, a good little. I don't know if you already did this. Again, I, I missed the first half of the show. I think this could be a good thing. Trump's campaign manager is watching this right now. What do you want him to know about how to turn this around, keep the momentum going the right way? What do you well, think? Uh, you may just miss what I said I, right before you came on. I, I had said, I, I think Trump has been more focused. He's been more on point. He hasn't had too many questionable tweets or ones that make you, you know, bang your head against the wall. I, I think just tell Trump to keep sticking to the script, you know, if you want to, you know, say, you know, certain things like you don't want to watch the NFL, if they don't, you know, like I think that resonates with people. Just don't get into ticky tack Twitter wars with Joe Scarborough and, and other people that don't matter. And just keep pushing the economy, economy, economy. And I, I think that's the best thing he could do. Okay. That's just that's just me. I don't know if Dane has a, a different. Yeah, I, I, I would yeah. say uh, remember the forgotten man. Trump won because he spoke to the forgotten man. He ran against big government and big business. Uh, he ran against the crooked elite and the Republicans and the Democrats, the crooked Wall Street tycoons who would outsource your job and then the, the politicians who would look the other way while it was happening. That's who he ran against. Don't be a Republican. Don't be a Democrat. Be your own thing and, and, and fight for the common man in this third way position, this populist position. You know, fight for the people of Youngstown, of, uh, you know, Western Pennsylvania, of, uh, you know, New Jersey, you know, all these areas that are working class, which it, it's not a racial thing. It's, it's, it's people think yeah. it's a racial thing. It's really not. Right. Uh, fight for those people and you'll win and you'll win big time. You know, yep. run against Wall Street, run against big business. Big business has done super well throughout the, all these shutdowns. Um, the little guys getting hurt. Stick up for the little guy. I think that there are the, the average American right now is very frustrated. They feel like their country has run away from them. They feel like they are prisoners in their own land and they're aliens in their own home. And uh, if you can articulate that and, and, and run on that, I think you'll do very well. That's, that's, that's why I think the uh, executive orders resonate in the moment right now. And I think it was the right thing to do. Um, yeah. Because again, it goes to the idea of fighting for, the forgotten man, the people who are struggling right now, the working class people who, you know, are struggling to make ends meet because again, the governments of each state pretty much told the economy like, Hey, you got to shut down economy. Um, so I think, I think again, uh, we could talk about the, the essence of, of each one, but I think it was the right thing to do for him. I agree. I agree. I, uh, I, think, the, I think a lot of people just need to start to, and I, I'm not one of these people that, you know, gets excited over the idea of a new Supreme Court court pick because someone will most likely be getting old or dying. But there's I think, gonna be at least two, I would exactly. think uh, that's uh, Ginsburg and, and really, I, mean, I think are the next logical two. The people who are on the fence about voting for Trump, I mean if you're at all conservative, you gotta you gotta at least consider that as a huge thing. Yep. And that's one of the reasons why I voted for him in 2016. I mean, that was like the night when I ran upstairs to tell my wife that Trump won at 3 a.m. I'm like, we got the Supreme Court back. <laughs> <laughs> or we held on to it at least. I know all that. I know some other people who uh, are like, I, I just don't understand. I know some people who voted for uh, who was that one guy, Evan McMuffin. Oh, He's what a loser. What a, what a, what a loser. loser. I know, I know someone who voted for him. He's probably listening. I, uh, I do too. I just, oh, yeah. Yeah, want to who, give him a little shout out, little Evan McMuffin, a shout out. Who who thinks like, hey, you know the problem, the problems of America in 2016. You know what the solution is? 
a <laughs> unmarried uh, <laughs> Goldman Sachs alumni weirdo, right? And I'm not saying just because he's not married, he's a weirdo, but he was just genuinely a weirdo. He's a creepy dude. And it's like, man, I want to let this guy babysit my kids, right? Because he was just weird. Who's letting Joe Biden babysit his kids? Well, I wouldn't either. He'd forget where they are in the upper down the house. Um, but Evan McMullen, right? He was just he was a grifter. He never paid any of his campaign staff. He was he was he was a loser and a grifter. And uh, yeah, he's confined to the ash heaps of history and, and good riddance, right? I, I, if you vote for Evan McMullen, I don't know what to say to you. you <laughs> You know, like I get I voting for Hillary. I get voting for Obama. I get voting for even Gary Johnson, like Evan McMullen. It's like not only do I want to throw away my vote, I, I want to feel horrible doing it at the same time. I don't know. <laughs> That's my take. Very good. All right. Well, Nico, I want to thank you so much for joining us. And thank Dane, you always me. your legendary commentary. It uh, it brings a lot of eyeballs, and just from kind of looking at the thing throughout the night, I think this might end up being our most viewed one consistently throughout the night. I mean, we were consistently between twenty and thirty people watching, which for us is a great thing. That was coming. Well, it it just escalated the. Uh, I I think so, and I also want to thank again Gino De, De Fabio, who's uh, you know again a huge Trump guy uh, for for sharing it. Um, we'd love to have him on at some point in time. Yeah, uh, can I thank our sponsor for tonight's episode? Yeah, who's our sponsor tonight? Uh, our sponsor is the Mountain Valley Sparkling Water. Um, you know, when I drink water, I like to pay as much money as I can for it um, because I, you know, heaven forbid my water tastes anything like tap. You know, I, I really like to put the premium <laughs> on the high quality water ingredients. You know, I want my water to taste like a little bit of minerality, a little bit of arsenic, um, just a hint of salt, and maybe some pepper if I'm feeling spicy that day. And the good thing is, the Mountain Valley Sparkling Water. Um, has all of those things, especially the arsenic in high doses. So uh, it's really great. Um, it comes in a really cool green bottle. And if, if you're the type of person that's like, I'm so insecure about myself, I want to shop at Whole Foods and buy my water at Whole Foods just so I don't ever think that I am a, 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 you know, a, a horrible person. Well, don't worry. The Mountain Valley Spring is, is there for you. So, uh, you know, get it at your nearest Whole Foods. Can I actually give a quick... Another quick shout out before we wrap this up. It's another sponsor. I'm wearing the shirt. We are young people. <laughs> oh, I thank you, Nico. We have great shirts, great designs. It's a uh, it's re it's a real nice little company that's being run by a great guy. Soft T-shirts like Tim Ryan's. I think you guys got to give it a look. Spread the word about it. Buy a shirt. Yeah. Pass the message along. I, I didn't even mention my poll that I did on on there. Um, we'll conclude with this. I, I ran a poll and I did one of these in sixteen on there. And I asked the Trump uh, Biden one, and, and Trump was slightly ahead. And, and I have a pretty diverse 4,000 uh, follower um, following, I guess I'll say that, on that group. And then I ran the, the Ryan uh, Hagan one, and it was a single digit race. So um, take it for what it's worth. Obviously, it's, it's very unscientific, but you know, 4,000 people. And again, I think it's a pretty good racial and, and economic and all that breakdown. So we'll, we'll have to see how close the results mimic that. Um, when the election actually happens. So, but thank you, Nico. And uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. We, like I said, I think we had a ton of people watching tonight. Hopefully you really enjoyed the show. Well, the election's starting to heat up. So I think the frequency of these will continue um, to, to ramp up a little bit and, and kudos to Dane for pushing me into this because we originally didn't have this plan tonight. So um, thank you for that. Thank you for your commentary. Like us on social media, Twitter, especially on Facebook. Share uh, the video, you know, share the video. And share the video. And if you don't want to watch the video, the podcast is literally going to be available um, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. on virtually every podcast app. Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, you name not, it, we got you're it. You're doing the Joe Rogan experience. You're not going Spotify exclusive. You're No, no, no. You know, when they want to give us our $100 million deal, then we'll start talking. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. He looks like if a meatball came to life, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't know. <laughs> He's okay. One last <laughs> message I think everyone needs to hear, and I think it is, I think everyone needs to do this. What? Go through a wide variety of news media for sources. Don't stick to one. Filter out the fake and the, the disinformation, and you just I, you really got to be be cautious, especially this election. There's a lot on the line. So, I agree. I just hey. don't think you should read or watch anything. I just put on a blindfold and then just 
whatever booth you you stumble into and ballot you it's what god intended that's what no i agree i agree i was being silly uh you're absolutely right that's a very good message yeah oh totally mm. next time i'll submit a question i wish i could have got your guys a stance on mail-in voting just you know i know it's a huge thing but that'll we'll, be a good topic for the next thing because i think that's going to be maryland hard. voting i am opposed to the state of maryland voting. It's, a, <laughs> it's a weird state the shape is the shape can we be real for a i know this episode's got to end but like what is up with the shape of Maryland? It is it is not cool. It like it it zigzags and then it's got Delaware eating out its like the back of it, like it's eat, taking chunks out. I, I I am opposed to the state of Maryland. I, I this they got a funky flag too. It's trippy. You did it, do they? Let me. Yo, know. yeah, they got the. Uh, it looks like one of those things you'd have to look at if you're like going through a psychology test. So everyone, it's, it's all trippy. Until the next uh, MV Red podcast, we want you all to look up the uh, flag from the state of Maryland. Because yes. if you're not from Maryland or you're not Michael, I don't think you know what the flag looks like. Yeah, you just got to Google it. You'd be, uh, I'm going yeah. to look right when it ends. That's for it's sure. A, it's a, it, it, and Shanley says, or Dane, uh, their flag is absurd, and, and I tend to agree. So on that note, we'll conclude. Again, thank you, everybody, for listening. Like us on social media. Subscribe to us. And um, – Please share on, on, on Facebook. We appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Have a good I, I hate Marilyn. Yeah. <laughs>